So it's really fun for me to see how stimulated everybody gets whenever we have an opportunity to put all of our brain power and our heart power to work at, at helping people get well. And so, um, you know, the whole point of this is, is not that you don't know any bioregulatory medicine and that it's all so complicated, but that whatever brings you here and what, what, whatever reason you're sort of entering this space is because you do know something about it. And I think at least it draws us in that you can, you know, you, you don't have to be anybody medical or whatever else. If you are medical or if you're in the healing profession, it really draws you in. But I think that the that the good news is that this really is provocative to all of us. And when we have a, a wonderful a regulatory person right in front of us, it just really stimulates all kinds of thinking and everybody's input. So eventually, or, or already, that's exactly what the, what the process that we're trying to um, support is. And so this is my favorite topic in the world, the matrix. And we've already touched on it. And so this lecture, you can put your pen down and you can um, just kind of, just kind of uh, listen. Because this is, this is the idea of understanding the profound way that you have to start thinking differently, at least for the likes of me, having come from a medical model and moving into um, biological regulatory medicine. And it is absolutely magic to me. And no matter how many years you've done this, and no matter how comfortable you are with your protocols and your treatment approaches, if you come back and think about the reality of the beings that we are, and the micro environment, and the macro environment around us, and the ways in which we're sort of contained and held and really part of, like we can't really separate ourselves from the environment, actually. We can't really separate ourselves from the cosmos. And you know, so much of our cultural training is that we are individual and floundering and this and that. And so understanding this kind of beautiful matrix that we come from um, is really comforting, but it also is a place to come back to as you go through the years, because if you're, if you're stuck with trying to help somebody or if you're stuck with trying to understand yourself, just go back to these, these ideas. It really, it's really, I wish I had a big IMAX screen. You know when you go to an IMAX movie and, and the sound is all around you and the visual is beautiful? That's sort of what this lecture is for me. But before that, I realized that I sort of started this little story about my my, how I came to be here and sort of left off before I uh, said that I did start practicing medicine in, in New Mexico. And the way that happened was that I met somebody at a party who asked me to come and do IVs in her office. And she showed me the Vega machine and she showed me dark field microscopy. And from there, we just built an office. And we had all kinds of different iterations of a biological medicine office that was really a gift because I think a lot of us tend to think of why we can't do it and why we might get regulated and why we might um, do the wrong thing. But the thing about this kind of medicine is it isn't harmful. We don't ever harm people. We really don't ever harm people. I think you can change their balance a little too quickly. And I think sometimes you have to remember that regulation means that things are balanced. And so when you walk, when you enter the system and do a, do a treatment, you're really asking the body to rebalance itself. And so the only thing you can do is maybe disrupt the, the balance as it stands. We'll talk a little bit about that. But um, I did. I got to practice uh, European biological medicine for, for many, many years in many different ways. And New Mexico back then anyway was a really good place to um, practice because it was unregulated. And so I didn't worry much about being regulated. I, I hear that that's changing everywhere. That I think that the allopathic profession anyway is really frightened about the reality of this. And they would never say that. I mean, that's just a way of kind of contextualizing a very complicated issue. But um, you know, if you quietly persist at your way of thinking, and, and I had some conversations at lunch about having to speak up. You know, now's the time to quietly but gently and insistently speak up about however you see um, things being unjust and needing to change. And, um, you know, that not only feeds our health in the world, but also is a really good way of um, surviving and being able to smile. Um, 
So anyway, I practiced um, biological medicine in, in, with lots of different iterations. And as I was thinking about you know, advice for or what it's like to practice that kind of medicine, I think that uh, in addition to gathering a toolbox, you need to collaborate with as many different practitioners as you can because each of us has wisdom and, and the, the only way that this works is, is a network. And so you need to team up and network with a dentist and with any kind of other health practitioner that you can find. And that that's really the way that people get well. So that an evaluation with all kinds of different perspectives comes together into something that's really profound. And, the, and another thing that I think is very important in that is that there's no hierarchy in this. And that's again, in regular medicine, that just doesn't work very well. In the olden days, the physician would tell you what to do and you would do it. So many of us have you know, elderly people, more elderly than me, people in their lives who take 100 pills. Well, okay, I think that Medicare did a study and the average um, elderly person is on 18 different prescriptions. That's the average, okay, and that, that, that doesn't include any vitamins or any minerals, but if you think that each of those medicine goes in and kind of changes this balance, and what regulation means is that your poor body has to figure out what to do with this new information that's stopping the whole balance thing, and so, you know, we're, we're really way off the mark, but um, I think you really need to collaborate and you need to have a sense of equality and you need to um, find mentors and then you need to mentor people. And so I think that these are things that we learned along the way, but the collaborating and disagreeing and thinking of different ways really come, comes out very well. Often you'll get a patient who kind of gets stuck with your, your system, they're not actually getting better or they're not getting better the right way. And then if you have somebody else with a different perspective, it sort of opens everything up. So I think that those things are, are very important. And a lot of people have been asking me, so in 2014, after a lot of years of really wonderful biological medicine practice, I, um, I was recruited to go enter the allopathic world and to try to set up an, a biological medicine, an integrated medicine system in a hospital system in, in New Jersey. And we, we laid the, we, we really had the best laid plans and I thought that I was ready. I mean, the final thing is to be able to, the final challenge is to be able to practice your medicine in the context of um, ologists without scaring them, you know, without making them feel like you have something that they don't. But anyway, I entered this, this world with a huge um, plan to build an integrative department in a hospital a big hospital, and it didn't go very well, and that was a little bit traumatic for me. But I did move to New Jersey to do that, and now I'm figuring out what I'm going to be doing. So that's my story, and now we're going to talk about understanding the biological matrix. So again, one of the things that um, was profound for me, the aha moment I had wasn't about the protocol. It wasn't about understanding homeopathy or acupuncture or any of those things. Those are the tools. What was interesting to me was the way that sort of the truth about how we, we as human organisms in this time and space got to be here. And so what I'm doing at the beginning of this lecture is to try to sort of give you a sense of this biological matrix, the mesenchyme, the milieu, the, you know, the things that surround us and how fabulously um, informative all of that is and, how, and this structure that has come up. So, I'm going to start sort of way out there with the Gaia principle, um, which actually I think was tried to be put into words not so long ago, um, actually as we sort of started into space travel and as people were trying to understand whether there was a big bang and how did this wonderful diverse universe ever get here. And so these are some of the principles. You can read this, and it, again, it's kind of the philosophy of all of this, but um, it really does make you wonder. So why is there life on Earth, and how did we get here? Life exists on Earth because conditions are suitable for survival. Conditions on Earth are suitable for survival because there is life on Earth. It sounds a little bit circular, but as you go in, this is this matrix. Life creates a vast feedback that ensures its own survival. All creatures from bacteria to humans contribute to maintaining an optimal environment for life. 
life, all of life, is a superorganism. Think of that, that everything we do and all the ways that we seek to inter interfere or help people regulate. But life is one big superorganism which has emerged because of its ability to ensure its own survival. And so I put this next statement in red because we really are at a crossroads. There's all of a sudden a species on Earth that has in the last 100 or 150 years made impacts in the environment and in this continuum that's lasted for at least two and a half million years so that we aren't, we as human beings, what we do doesn't necessarily ensure our own survival. And so we could speak about that in a different context, but that's pretty profound. And so that makes me feel like a call to action that we need to make sure that we understand that. And now is the time for some sort of a revolution or an evolution, but it's the kind of revolution and evolution that's sort of spiritual and energetic. But what is it gonna be that we have a species now forever and ever, everything you did, it was like, there was no garbage or trash because everything could be recycled and regenerated and life has created these phenomenal systems for you know everything that's your waste is somebody else's food but that's not so true anymore and so that's why we really need to understand that all of this and spend some time thinking about it so life on earth requires a complex completely inter interdependent system of feedback loops created from information in the environment. And um, we've said this in previous lectures, but it's just another way of saying it. So the matrix is the meeting ground. It's the organizing force that has created life. And um, so much of what happens is in the mesenchyme, it's kind of like in the space between. And so if you have any, if you've ever done any spiritual or um, psychic kinds of practice. We spend a lot of time trying to think of the gap, like spending some time, like even meditation is, is that time in between the thoughts. It's the gap. And, and in a way, that gap is, is the communication network that, that has gotten us here. I like to think about that. Each input, this is very important for regulatory medicine, which is that each input to the system causes a small change in the, in, in the entire environment. So I think in you know, a blatant way of saying that is in allopathic medicine, we take out people's ovaries assuming that that's not going to kill them and that maybe it'll give them some hot flashers or this, that, and other. But that the symptoms we do, that's a really profound intervention in people. But nobody, none of us spend a lot of time unless we pull ourselves back thinking about this is a really neat balance that's very wise and has been working very well for two and a half million years. And yet, you know, we have this whole medicine that, that's putting people on methotrexate and when you turn and say, does it seem to help you? You know, and it's the, the pain person, the pain medicine person who's on all these opioids, but they're still in pain. And so you say, well, it'd be one thing if this, you know, at least took your pain away a little bit. But I'm, I'm just saying that we need to remember that there's this whole system and that you need to be very careful with the way that you intervene, respectful. You need to be respectful of it. The matrix is the message and the messenger. This is, like I said, very circular, but it all, it'll all it all help the rest of it permeate. And it is the con underlying concept for this whole kind of medicine. So, you know, the environmental movement came up in the 70s as, as what it was. And before that, with wise people like Rachel Carson who are trying to say we cannot continue to desecrate the environment because we are the environment, we aren't separate from the environment and we're gonna pay. So nobody listened very much, but at least in the past three or four decades, people became environmentalists or they became ecologists because we were really concerned with the external environment and we really understood that ecology meant that everything was in balance and that if you took if you did monoculture crop growing, that the crops actually wouldn't be as healthy because really you need the ants and the insects and you need the birds and you need, you know, you need all of the species because there's this big interchange. And so we understand that maybe externally, like rainforests and wetlands and watersheds, but <coughs> these principles have never gotten into the into the mainstream of modern Western medicine because if they did our medicine would have to change. 
And so bioregulatory medicine is the new medicine because the premises include systems thinking. I mean, this is obvious, but it's also good to, to um, review it. Western medicine represents a very influential, and this fact to me is true whether you see or completely clear of regular doctors or not, but the way that we think and the way that we put things together is very linear and it really informs the understanding of health and disease, um, which has happened in the past, well, since probably the turn of the 1900s, in a very precise and detailing of organ systems as which was, I think, very, very useful because at the beginning, understanding things from a microscopic level as well as from a macroscopic level was really useful in understanding the huge wisdom of this, of this continuum that is life on Earth. Um, but I think that the Western medicine model, though it did some very good things, has really provided um, some trouble. And so we need to change this. So, you know, there are these new chronic illnesses of this century just in, in this, um, in our world, in our everyday life. So, that, you know, obesity is an epidemic and type 2 diabetes and heart disease, all of those are epidemics. And really allopathic medicine, if you sit and talk with people who practice, really don't know how to do that. We know how to put lots and lots of people on lots and lots of different medicines, but they don't actually get better. Their blood sugars don't come down. They don't restore their energy. And, and what do we do? Well, we just send them to the next ologist. There really is sort of a crisis in that. I was interviewing at one point at <laughs> Temple University because they wanted an integrative medicine program. And I sat with the director, and I was very excited about just a little bit of this. And I was saying, you know, if you really look at obese people and you, and you help them lose weight and you, you know, do their vitamin D and you relieve their stress and laid out some simple functional medicine things, I said, you know, then, then there would be no more type 2 diabetes. And he looked at me and he said, that would be terrible. He said, I wouldn't have a job. And so I know we were just bantering, but, you know, there's something wrong with that model. And it would be terrible for him because, well, he would probably be able to retire. I don't want any terrible for anything, anybody. But um, anyway, so we do need a new paradigm, and I think it's coming, but I think it's coming slowly. So I wanted to talk for a minute about what I, I, I wanted to illustrate what I'm really talking about. And so I think a good example of what I'm really talking about is this notion of medications that have effects and side effects. Because every single one of us has been on a medicine that has a side effect or has a friend that's been on a medicine that has had a side effect. So what do we say? We say the effect of the medicine is what will help you and then there will be all these silly side effects. So the commercials say this medicine will, you know, they take the poor little woman who's sitting in the chair and they wind her up and then she's happy and she's walking around feeling not depressed. And so everybody's like, well, let me have that pill. I'd like to have that. And then the mumble starts and this very, very fast set of words go in about all the side effects. Okay. So that said, actually every effect of a medicine and every side effect is the same. And it's a crazy monkey business. We understand that. I just like to bring it back up, there, you give somebody a, re a remedy or a medicine, it, the effects and the side effects are actually all the same. And the question is, can you tolerate the side effects? And why do you even have side effects? And really, what are the effects? And so what actually happens is, say you go on a, well, I'm going to give the example of a high blood pressure medicine. So your blood pressure is a perfect regulatory system. We have to regulate all the time. We stand up, we sit down, we breathe hard, we breathe slowly, we sleep, we eat. All of this is a demand on this wonderful circulatory system we have. And blood pressure really has to go up and down. But sometimes it gets too high, and that is a stress on the whole pipe system. So we've invented remarkably effective ways of stopping that regulation. So the whole idea of giving somebody anti tension starts with the premise that high blood pressure is really hard on the pipes because it's too much pressure in this closed system. And so if we bring blood pressure down, that's got to be better, right? The numbers have got to be better. And so 
when the person has side effects, what does the physician say? You call their office and they say, don't worry, the side effects will go away. And what's so amazing is that they really will go away. They will get wor uh, better. People tolerate the medications. Our, our lovely patient just said she goes on methotrexate on Friday so that she can feel terrible on Saturday and Sunday so that she can go back to work on Monday. Because if she takes it on Sunday night, then it's going to kind of ruin the week. But her body t somehow somehow manages. It's really that the whole system has to regulate every time you take methotrexate. And so maybe that would be fine and good. But then if you say, do you feel better? Because I was actually asking that question with the expectation that if she takes it once a week, I mean, it's a kind of a crazy thing because it doesn't actually have a way of lasting, but that's, that's a separate thing. But if she takes it once a week, I was wondering if when the week was up, she felt worse, like she actually got stiffer or something. Because you'd think that the rheumatologist would think, well, we give it once a week, and then if it's working, you're actually going to have symptoms and be glad to take it again. But what she says is, nope, I just got to get over taking it. It takes my weekend away. And then I'm not even sure if it helps. Well, I'm saying loud and clear, why are we using it then? But that's a separate question. Anyway, so if the side effects are overwhelming, you're politely told to wait a little bit longer. Sometimes they double the dose. I've seen that so many times with antidepressants. You're feeling anxious and you're feeling jittery. Well, you probably need a little bit more. And um, what are we asking of the symptom? We're asking for, I mean, what are we asking of this regulatory system? We're asking your body to regulate and regulate so that the symptoms go away. It's amazing. So um, the desired goal of the therapy is by definition the effect and everything else is the side effect. And then I just wanted to give an example of how we use our pharmaceuticals. So we have minoxidil, which was actually a medicine that was revolutionary when I was first in medical school because it was very effective at regulating blood pressure. It, it just lowers your blood pressure. The numbers go down. And so um, a lot of people, even though they may need to have lower blood pressure, do feel kind of crummy because you've, you've just stopped the regulation of the blood pressure, but your body still has to get up and walk and do all of its things, but now it can't regulate its blood pressure. So it's kind of like ripples in a pond where you have to figure out all these other mechanisms in your body that are meant to preserve health have to regulate themselves so that you can not have your blood pressure regulate. Does that, does, was that clear enough? I mean, you know, this is talking about a web and when you, when you, okay, when you throw a stone into the water, then there's ripples everywhere. And that's what we do when we're dealing with this wonderful regulatory medicine. So, um, so uh, I went back. So, you know, I, I said that already, but anyway, does anybody know what the side effect of uh, minoxidil is? Some people are nodding their heads. Hairiness, hair growth. So, guess what? So really, minoxidil and Rogaine are the same. And you take minoxidil, which is a blood pressure medicine for this doctor, and you rub it on his scalp, and now it makes you hairy, and guess what the side effect is? lowering your blood pressure. So people who want to have nice hair, it only sometimes grows your hair. But I mean, this is to me a prime example of the fact that we are messing with a system and then we have this overlay system where people are, people don't like to be, not have enough hair on their heads. I mean, we don't want to be hairy everywhere, but we not like to have enough hair on our heads. And so the idea that when the side effects, so now the people that are lowering their blood pressure are sort of dizzy and lightheaded for a few weeks and they're getting hairy and maybe that's not so good but maybe it is and so then all of a sudden with marketing we take exactly the same medicine and we give it to normotensive people because they need more hair and now the side effect is going to be feeling lightheaded and dizzy and so i just think it's a very good um, caveat to not get drawn into the fact that this is not a good use of the system and so I'm going to skip most of this because I think most of you know this. But the, 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 what's missing from the medical model beyond a dependence on pharmaceuticals and your prescription pads is that we don't allow the right thinking. Because if we did, then the model would collapse. And so you know, you go to the, somebody, what was it? Dr. Tom this morning put up 
a, a, an ologist thing, and there was no lymphologist, but he put up all the specialists. And so it's really easy to have a system that is messing with this bioregulatory model that is our matrix that has um, been a very wise envir inter-environmental system for two million years. It's really nice if you can just be responsible for the gastro or the derm or the onc system without any regard to how you're going to affect all of the other systems. And, you know, it's just the wrong thinking. And so I think that what was, you know, what the most drastic for me as an allopathic medicine person was the realization that I was so done with what that that really wasn't something I could fall back on. And so if we're in a day and age when these medications are not good, that means that there isn't a, you, you do have this sense that, a lot of patients have this sense that if they get a really bad infection, they'll go ahead and take an antibiotic, but they're gonna try to do all these other things before the big guns come out, right? And so my coming of age was the idea that that actually doesn't work and that I really have to believe that it doesn't work. And it's not that I might not give an antibiotic, I might, because sometimes it's like the, the thing to do while you're fixing the rest of the system. But when you realize that the Western model is about to break, and that is um, probably coming up, that it's doing more damage than good, it's, it's quite a lot for most people to understand. Anyway, so let's go back to the idea of the matrix. Um, this internal human matrix is an internal ecosystem and it's a spontaneously self-organizing system. It's evolved over time to include complex adaptations in response to the environment with an ever-increasing order and complexity. This is an, an, a massively wonderful system and as bioregulatory medicine people, we need to keep visiting these ideas because it, it goes on and on forever. And when I hear each of us talking about the ways in which we are, you know, the ways in which we see magic when we properly intervene with the ecosystem, it's very comforting to me because it means that we can get everybody to be feeling better and that there's always another solution. But, but this matrix is chaotic, which means that you can't really predict it. It's complex, which we know from the get-go, and it's also adaptive. It really is a remarkable thing, this life and these ecosystems that we've evolved. And so something that's chaotic, complex, and adaptive, and gets wiser over time is something to me. So the practice of bioregulatory medicine requires a deep understanding of this complex, chaotic, and adaptive system, which is never static. Bioregulatory medicine requires each of us to remember that every therapeutic intervention changes and reorganizes the entire ecosystem. Bioregulatory medicine is the superb art of relationship. When you have a matrix, you have a broad-based dispersal of power, which was what I was talking about when I was saying that in your office and among your colleagues, you can't really have a hierarchy anymore because no one component is more fundamental than the others. The matrix causes a chaotic but predictive emergence of dynamic regulation in each of us. So I think James was the one that touched on this, and I, I like the, the evolution of ideas. Walter Cannon, who came up with the idea of homeostasis, was a professor of physiology at Harvard, and I think this was in the 30s or 40s, but he was very serious about understanding why our concept of medicine as late as the 30s and 40s was, was hard, because um, he didn't understand that there was sort of a he, he was trying to understand this property of a system, like what is it inside an animal or a, a human where things like blood pressure and temperature, which have to be very closely regulated, we, we die if the pH of our blood, this is separate from alkaline and acidity in other systems, but the pH of our blood is regulated within about a, a, a half of a milligram percent. I mean, you know, you can have a pH that, that can vary somewhere around seven, and if your blood pH goes much higher or much lower than that, you die. The same for temperature, the same for heart rate, everything. Very, very narrow maintenance. And he didn't know what that system was that regulated it. And so he was really trying to understand that. And so he put out the idea that there were these physiological set points which are unchanging, and they were within a very narrow range. But 
actually it's a little bit more complicated to that because things are adaptive and because things are dynamic. So if you regulate one system, it's going to cause change in every system. And he was looking for the one thing that made this happen. And so um, there was a lot of arguments in the literature. Cannon was, you know, he wrote, he wrote very astute articles and then people would just sort of rip them apart and say why he didn't get it right. And a lot of people didn't want this idea of set points to exist that really sort of bugged them. So the next model was one of allostasis, which I think is a good model to think of when you're trying to really get your hands around how to work with this matrix. And so in summary, allostasis means stability through change. And so if you think of a family dynamic, that's a good way of understanding stability through change. Because you know, when you're in a family, when everything is getting more and more complicated and everybody is changing, you need to sort of maintain some sort of stability, but not assuming that not everything will change at every minute. And so to me, allostasis, I mean, uh, to all of us, I think the very first model of of what bioregulatory medicine was going to become was this idea of allostasis. And that it's very dynamic and that everything is constantly changing. And that the idea when you do an evaluation is to understand how to unload the system. So when you have all these stressors, diet and, and deep going things like your the DNA of your ancestors, all of the things that we've talked about that sort of impede the regulation of the system are taken in by this remarkable regulatory matrix and the balance is still in balance because otherwise you know you would die but the it's kind of like the balance point is very very rigid and very very low so it's like you're you have a big balance thing and you're still you know not rubbing the ground but each of the stressors um, each of the stressors sort of make the allostasis um, more burdened. But that means that if you, if you did have a big balance and you had all these different stressors on it, you can't just take one off and expect everything to balance again. So it's just a good model to remember with the sort of reverence and respect that we always need as people who are helping people's health is that this is a very fine-tuned balance and you have to, you have to be aware of that. And so um, this, under, this really demands an understanding that a state of dynamic balance is in an increasingly wise and complex system, and that you can't do that with protocols or with linear solutions. No matter what your modality is, it's never going to be the same for the same person, which makes it maybe a little bit um, overwhelming to think that you can ever learn any of it. But it also gives me a confidence that you could always find us a way in makes you careful and it keeps you interested. So every single intervention affects the entire system. Restoring health means constant learning on the part of the practitioner as well as the patient. That means that every day that you come in to see patients, you have to be present and you have to be astute. And those things are not so um, easy to do because we're all bioregulatory organisms walking around trying to help other bioregulatory organisms. And, but don't ignore it when a patient tells you that the intervention has made him worse um, because that's like selling that, well, the side effect will go away. So I think that sometimes I have a, a heavy handed idea that this whole series of things that I'm doing, your drainage and this, that, and the other, is good for you. And it may be good for you in the long run, but if the, if the regulation is too much, then you can, actually, you can actually put more stress on a system that you're trying to balance. Every change you make to one system affects every other system, even the ones that didn't need changing. So matrix re regulation results in reconstitution at ever new set points with elaborate checks and balances. Practicing regulatory medicine requires a deepening respect and understanding of the complex and completely interdependent biological matrix. Every encounter with a patient provides us with a unique opportunity and it is the energy flow between the practitioner and the patient that is as important as any thing you do to a patient or for a patient. So going back to this, take a very detailed history which requires both time and attention. Allow your patient to tell the entire story. Try to listen and try to make sure that you understand. 
try to retell, this is a good exercise to do, try to retell the patient the story that you heard to make sure that the way they understand their own regulation is the way you got it. Because otherwise, the goals will be different. And then this uh, goes without saying, there's lots of different tests for bioregulation and I, um, I think it's remarkable how many different ways we have to gently stress somebody either by cooling them down, which is what um, CRT does, or by muscle testing, which is putting something in the field and watching for tolerance or weakness. Um, but there's all these different very fine-tuned ways of sort of testing whether you can regulate or not. Heart rate variability tests the ability for the nervous system to go from lying down to standing up, which we do a thousand times a day. And you know, but but to watch how the, what the system has to do to get that balance so that you can stand up and keep walking, it's just remarkable. These technologies we have, the technologies are good. It's just that we can't think of them as being one size fits all. And so, develop a toolkit to evaluate the patient's ability to regulate. And then I wrote all kinds of different ones. And this can go on and on and on. But I think at the bottom of this slide are things that we really, really need to understand. And the most important one is that we need to have joy and we need to have fun and we need to play. And so, you know, what parasympathetic activity is, is losing track of the time. What it is, is about allowing yourself to kind of be like a child and you know, dress up if you want or do something imaginative. But the, but the way to restore a lot of these systems is not necessarily even through remedies of any kind, but it's about understanding, um, it's about what it is to understand about being a piece of this huge and wonderful, reliable um, network. So assess pain levels. I think it's a good question to ask, where do you hurt because Sometimes what you'll get is not my wrist or my ankle, but I hurt because my sister is an, an addict, or I hurt because the people in my town don't like a certain congregation of people. And, you know, those are the things that make us hurt, and if we listen to those, we can't necessarily um, change them, but we can be very respectful of them. Um, you know, so assessing pain in your physical body and in your being. And what are the triggers and antecedents and mediators of physical or emotional pain? I think it's really important to remember how lonesome Americans are, that, that there are so many places where our sense of community has been, has been really broken down. We spend time by ourselves or in our own little stressed out family units because, which is great, it's great to have a family, but you know, we need community. We need community, and now that we have cyberspace, we can have community in cyberspace. James and I were saying it's not the same to, you know, to, to check in with you over the airwaves, but it does really, it really does take the place of, you know, having to travel to be together. So I think it's very important to have community, and I think it's very important to every day get up and imagine what is it that really makes you tick. What are you passionate about? Ask people that because they always have something. The bro most broken down people, if they can't think of that, I'll say to people in the middle of this whole thing, how many medicines do you take? What surgeries do you have? What do you do for fun? And if there's a long pause and then the people say, I really don't ever have fun, that's, that's one thing you can do before you know any of your remedies is figure out how they can play. So, and then go back to that first slide about the the Gaia principle about how we got here. The new medicine is a science and an art with a limitless combination of possibilities. Da, 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 da. And maybe that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> maybe you could advance it for me just because I'm not sure what else. Yeah, there are? Okay, well the last slide after a few said, it's the environment dummy, so thank you very much. <laughs>